everyone. Hello and welcome to The Current, the North Central Region Water Network's speed networking webinar series. Uh, the North Central Region Water Network is a university extension-led collaboration among land grants and our partners in 12 upper Midwestern states. I am Rebecca Power and I will be your moderator today. Our presentation uh, today, or our three presentations, are focused on promoting natural and healthy shorelines for protecting lakes. Um, you may know some colleagues that weren't able to attend today, so uh, we do record these sessions and make them available afterwards at northcentralwater.org and learn.eextension.org. Uh, for those of you participating in today's session, please, uh, you can submit your questions for presenters in the chat box uh, at any time, and the chat box should appear in the lower left-hand portion of your screen, so we'll be monitoring and collecting those questions for after the presentations are complete. Uh, that those we'll, we'll be presenting for about 30 minutes, maybe a little bit longer today, um, so we hope to have uh, plenty of time for discussion. And you see there uh, at the bottom of the screen too, uh, a phone-in option can be accessed by clicking on the telephone handset icon located in the upper left area of, of your screen uh, if you are having sound issues. So our presenters today are Julia Kirkwood from the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality and she's going to be telling us a little bit about the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership. Bindu Bhakta is from Michigan State University Extension and she will be talking about the importance of natural shorelines uh, and uh, some lessons learned from property owner and train the trainer programs. And finally, we have uh, Pamela Toshner and Pat Gaugan uh, from the Wisconsin DNR and University of Wisconsin, uh, respectively. And they will be talking about best practices for lake friendly living. So without further ado, we'll get to the We'll get to the good stuff and uh, get to Julia Kirkwood's presentation. And you can see a little bit about her there on your screen. We won't go through and read all that, but uh, the purpose of the current is to not only give you these short snippets about cool stuff going on around the region, but also to introduce you to the cool people that are doing it. So um, welcome, Julia, and uh, go ahead. Hey, thank you. So just a little bit about the Shoreline Partnership. It's a statewide partnership and it's made up of state agencies, academia, nonprofits, and private industry. Oops. And what our mission was is to promote natural shorelines through the use of different green landscaping technologies and bioengineered erosion control. It was formed in 2008 with the belief that we wanted a change from your traditional seawalls to better shoreline erosion control practices that were effective at stabilizing the shoreline erosion, that preserved or restored the ecological function of that shoreline, and that were also attractive to property owners. This was really important is what we were seeing over the years was that the, as development increased, we saw significant increases in that shoreline armoring as well. And the percentages were obviously more increased in our southern part of the state. But it was becoming more of, a, of an issue. We also, and the reason why this is an issue from that seawall perspective, while it can control that shoreline erosion, what it does is it ends up breaking that system. When that vertical seawall comes in, it creates a barrier between the land and the water in that transition zone for the animals that live on the land that into the, can't really get into the lake easy and from the animals that live in the water that need to get out on the land. It was very difficult for them to do that. And what happens is come in and fill behind and then what also happens is that wave energy that's hitting that shoreline that used to hit a nice natural shoreline is now hitting a vertical seawall and that energy needs to go someplace. 
And what that does is that energy goes down and scours out that bottom and takes away the benthic area, that bottom layer where the plants would grow, as well as where the macroinvertebrates, like the fish food, would live. And then what also happens is that wave energy goes sideways, creates wave flanking, and erodes neighbors' properties as well, and it creates a proliferation of seawalls. So we, again, we wanted something different. Also, in 2007 and 2012, the National Lakes Assessment was continued or uh, completed for the first time ever, actually, in 2007. And what it was really indicating was that Michigan does have a gap. With our, uh, we had over 40% of our lakes rated as having poor nearshore habitat. And that's for a variety of different reasons, maybe seawalls and a loss of um, vegetation, both in and on the land and in the water as compared to only about 10% of, from the 2012 data, as our lakes having issues with nutrients and turbidity. Additionally, there was another 20% of our lakes that had fair nearshore habitat. So that was like almost 60% of our lakes are threatened due to this nearshore habitat loss. So one of the things that we want to challenge, too, is thinking about natural um, the continuum for erosion control is that it's a no-mo zone, is maybe a simple low energy solution on smaller lakes compared to this higher, larger lakes, where more than likely you're going to have a much more engineered solution, and rock is probably going to be that option. So what we want people to recognize is that one size doesn't fit all, and there are a number of options out there. And how we're doing this is that we're taking this comprehensive approach and doing, looking at training contractors on how to design and implement these different bioengineering practices. We want to educate property owners to create that demand for those contractors, as well as help property owners understand what the challenges and what the issues are and why it's important. We also create demonstration sites for the different techniques and technologies that might be used to um, solve some of the erosion control. And then we're looking at regulation both at the state level, what can we change, and then what can we facilitate also at the local level for policy changes. So our contractor training, our first one was done in 2010. And for a couple of years we did two classes each, and then now we're down to just one class um, annually. And it's a two-day classroom with a one-day field day of contractors learning how to install these different techniques. And they also have to take an exam. And if they pass the exam, they, are, um, they can be listed on the Michigan National Shoreline Partnerships website under the contractor list. So homeowners can go to our website and search out for a contractor near them. From a permitting standpoint at the state level, we've been able to make some changes in our inland lake permitting system that encourages bioengineering techniques and makes it a little easier to get permits for um, smaller sites. And we can also, we've also made some changes that actually discourages seawalls. While it's still legal to put in seawalls, it makes it a little more difficult. And then also from the local policy standpoint, we created two guidebooks to help uh, local officials make changes and understand what those changes and options are at the local level that they, that they can implement to protect their inland lakes as well. We've created a plant list that is divided into three different sections, or four different sections actually, to where they are most successful at the lakeshore. They are, these lists are all online on this partnerships website, and there's a picture linked uh, to, for homeowners can go on and see a picture and find out more information. And these plants are all native to Michigan. They're very, um, they're spread throughout the state and they're fairly easy to grow, as, not challenging to grow as well. We also have a property owner education, the property owner education uh, program includes a shoreline educator network, which is a train the trainer. And I'm going to let Bindu talk about that a little bit more. The other um, large component of our property owner education is the Michigan Shoreland Stewards Program that we launched last spring. It's an online survey that any property owner can take, and it's free. 
and it is designed to recognize homeowners or property owners for you know, maintaining their property in a healthy way. There are three different recognition levels. You can do bronze, silver, and gold for those that qualify. And then if they don't qualify, it, the survey will indicate that they're a starter. Any Inland Lake property owner can participate. Again, it's free. I mean, it can be residential, a business. It could be a community or a park. So not everyone will qualify. Changes can be made to go back and qualify, but even then there are some properties that just will never qualify. And we do have an option for uh, people with properties with seawalls that they can potentially become a shoreland steward. What we wanted to, re we recognize that the seawalls were not necessarily going anyplace, but we recognize also there are some things that homeowners can do to lessen the impacts of those seawalls. So we wanted to give homeowners that opportunity to go that route as well, as opposed to shutting down that conversation. And so there are a lot of things that they can do. It's a, little more, it's a lot more difficult, but it can still be done. Unlike you know, this property right here in that picture, it just will never qualify. We divided the property into four different zones, so it's not just the shoreline area. We're looking at the entire lakefront property, looking at what's going on in the upland, the buffer zone, which is the first 35 feet, the shoreline zone, as well as, and then the in-lake zone, the littoral zone, and asking questions about their management practices. So what's best for Michigan Lakes is what we try to do is take our um, Michigan DNR's conservation guidelines and integrate them into the survey in terms of what do we want to see and what are those highest levels to reach that gold level. And we've developed some graphics uh, like this one to show, to give a little fun way to show like, you know, not having certain, uh, what those percentages look like from a vegetation because that vegetation component is a key component to qualifying for different levels of the Shoreland Stewards program. So when you go in onto the website, it's Michi um, myshorelandstewards.org, and you can take it either anonymously or register. And we, we left that open uh, for a variety of reasons, um, but we prefer people to register. Uh, questions, each question has its own page. The question, the answers, and then below then those answers will be more information, these drop down box to help people understand what we're looking for, to give ideas on, on different pictures and uh, why this is important, why that question is important. Throughout, again, there are some graphics to help people to understand those different zones and how to apply that information to their property. There are also pictures throughout the survey that, um, like these where each of them is annotated. It can talk about why each of them is a problem, what, what we're looking for, or what, why this is good. So again, providing the, them with more information. And at the end of the survey, this is a picture of what the end of the survey looks like from a person that has registered. It indicates if, uh, what level they have achieved. You're allowed to review your answers, go back and review what you answered. You can't change your answer, but you can review everything. And then there's also options for, uh, if you've registered, they'll show like um, areas for improvement to give people ideas of how to improve their score and the changes that they can make. Registered people can print a certificate, they can print their entire report, and they can clear answers and start a new survey. We're working on updates where they can actually archive their survey and, and so, it, so that's still, the previous one is still there. And they can also upload pictures as well. Not a lot of people have done it, but um, some of them have. A certificate will be automatically generated for registered people that have the name, the date, and the lake name and they can go ahead and print it and it's color coded to the level they've qualified for. And then both anonymous and uh, register people have the option of purchasing a sign as well. We have three different size options and they are three different colors as well. The other option is for Lake Association registration. And when Lake Associations register, they have access to educational materials that they can use to promote the program. An icon is placed on a map on the web on our the, the Shoreline Stewards website. And then it, the other really cool option is it becomes their own program. And 
what they do is it gets put into the drop down box for the, during the registration process and at the end of the survey if I was a resident on their lake an email will go to the lake association contact indicating that I have finished the survey and what my score was and those folks can go in and see the results as well. So the Shoreland Stewards program has been alive for a little over a year and we set goals for uh, year one and year five and for year one we have met or exceeded almost all of the goals that we set and in particular the one that kind of shocks me is the 10, we had a goal of 10,000 feet becoming short, um, you know, being qualified as shoreland stewards and we're at almost 72,000 feet and that's even with for the first few months we weren't actually gathering that um, the, the shoreline footage information. So we're really happy with the progress so far. So what's next? We're looking at connecting this program better with our score of the shore, the uh, shoreline habitat assessment, trying to get lake associations or groups involved in doing an inventory prior to promoting the program so that way they can um, do this, promote the program and see what, and go back in five years and see what the results are and see if things have stayed the same, have gotten better or gotten worse. It's a good way of starting uh, tracking progress and marking success. We're also working on a Shoreland Stewards Leader Training Program. So to, with the audience being Lake Association volunteers to help them be that more local resource and that contact person for the Shoreland Stewards. And then we're also working on some updates to the website as well that makes it a little more user uh, behind the scenes that we can use more data and um, track some more information. So I think that's all I have and this is a picture of one of our larger signs at a gold level uh, qualified property. So I think that's all I have and then Bindu should be up next. Good afternoon everybody. Thanks to the North Central Region Water Network for allowing this opportunity um, to talk about some of the work that we are doing here in Michigan related to natural shorelines and I wanted to give a special um, thank you to colleague Lois Wilson for um, organizing the panel today. Julia already mentioned um, the four objectives of the Natural Shoreline Partnership, so today I wanted to focus on objective number two. Um, so early on, uh, the partnership was training certified natural shoreline professionals to have the technical expertise and practical experience of designing and assessing the natural shorelines. Um, MNSP needed to start educating homeowners about the importance of natural shorelines. Um, so that there would be um, this ready set um, kind of bank of folks who are very able and willing to help um, homeowners to be able to design and install natural shorelines. Before this could happen, of course, we needed to train a network of um, shoreline educators who could deliver this education. So today I'm going to be focusing again on um, the objective of the partnership number two, um, in which I'm going to be talking about the work that I have been involved with here in Michigan, um, particularly in Southeast Michigan, where I've been coordinating a couple of the Train the Trainer Shoreline Educator Network training. So. Um, building that bank of shoreline educators that can deliver um, education to homeowners and then also the natural shoreline workshops that I've been um, a part of in my area of the state um, in which we train uh, basically deliver education to homeowners. We've been doing this work since 2012. To give a little bit of perspective on um, Michigan, if you're not familiar, um, we have, you know, you've heard that uh, us, our state being referred to as the water wonderland. So I've included a few statistics here that you may have seen or heard about before. We have um, a, a great number of lakes here. Um, we have 23,500 miles of shoreline. Um, and I want to draw your attention to the red asterisk down at the bottom of this, um, the bottom right side of 
of the state of Michigan there. Um, so this is Oakland County, and this is where I'm going to focus um, talking about uh, today the programs that I'll be um, referring to have taken place here in Oakland County. Um, and one thing to note about the colors on this map is that the blue, uh, the darker the blue color, the the greater number of um, inland lakes are occur in these different counties. So where you see that asterisk, that's at Oakland County. That's part of a larger uh, metro Detroit area of three counties. And um, the population is about 1.2 million or more. And um, it, this is one of the areas where you see lots of blue, so a lot of in the inland lakes located here. Um, and some studies have shown that you know access and proximity to high qual quality water resources increases property value. So a recent study by Zillow showed um, what you may have heard before was that um, more than 100 million homes were listed on the real estate website Zillow, and they found that um, across the country, waterfront homes are worth more than double the value of homes overall. So with shoreline properties plentiful here in Michigan, as well as some other adjacent states, um, comes the possibility of developing inland lake shorelines. Um, what were once seasonal cottages now sometimes turn into year-round um, residences, and there's a great need for education about the importance of natural shorelines. So as I mentioned, I'll be focusing on um, the work that I've done here in Oakland County with, uh, in partnership with the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership. And before I go on, I wanted to just point to uh, provide you with a few uh, visuals for some of the scenes that we see here in Oakland County, where I'm going to be talking about um, the programs that I've done. So on the left side of the screen um, are some uh, common sites that you'll see around inland lakes here. Um, lawn to the water's edge, so lawn is not a very stabilizing uh, plant at the shoreline, so we see erosion issues, um, stormwater runoff. We also have a lot of issues with um, Canada geese grazing at the very nice lush grass that's to the water's edge. We have um, hardened structures at the shoreline, so we're trying to um, figure out ways that we can make those areas more natural, lack of um, native plant communities, as well as habitat for fish and wildlife. So there on the right, you can um, see a lot of um, what we want to point people to. Some of the stats um, here for the Shoreline Educator Network. Uh, so. Um, approximately eight have been provided statewide, um, and you can see how many people have been trained across the state. And um, they also have the ability to be listed at the website, so you can see um, that there are at least 51 or more people that have been trained through these educator network trainings and have been listed on a site, um, on the MNSP website, so that other people can find them and um, contact them about shoreline education. A little bit about um, the Shoreline Educator Network. So as part of the training, there's an online toolkit um, where customizable PowerPoints are available. There's some activity ideas, additional resources, um, and then also templates for flyers and promotional materials, agendas, things like that, that educators can use to, de to design their own um, workshops. Um, there's also an opportunity for um, folks who complete the Shoreline Educator Network training to have their events listed on the MNSP website. And um, as I had mentioned, the educator listing, so they have the opportunity to either be listed or not um, so that people from the public can um, find them if they, if they wish to be found. So here are um, just some of the resources that are available as part of that um, Shoreline Educator Toolkit. Uh, some of the outcomes that we have found from the Shoreline Educator uh, train the trainer sessions. So here are just uh, some of the stats that we um, at, at, that we were able to glean from a post survey that was done after a, a few rounds of the Shoreline Educator um, trainings. So you can see how many um, programs 
individuals were planning. Um, they in, many indicated that there were, no, you know, they didn't have any barriers to implementing um, their planned programs, and they did indicate what kind of assistance that they would like to see in the future. Um, and one one comment that was made was that they were hearing from people that in through their workshops that many people were looking for this kind of um, an opportunity. So here are just some numbers from the programs that uh, we did here in Oakland County. So roughly seven um, workshops were held during this time frame, and about 370 people were uh, trained through it. The homeowner workshop, there are some um, key nuts and bolts that I wanted to share. So related to the target audience, um, it wasn't just uh, homeowners or property owners. It was you know, some people who were just interested in learning more about natural shorelines, aquatic um, plant applicators, volunteers from various programs that are offered not only through Extension but other organizations, um, lake management professionals, um, members of lake boards and lake associations. Um, and some municipal staff as well. The timing of these offerings for the homeowner programs, we always chose March, um, which was a time when not too much was going on, and we were uh, successfully able to gather crowd, a, crowd, a good crowd of people um, at a time when they were willing to stay inside and, and learn about natural shorelines. Um, the speakers consisted of state um, agency uh, professionals as well as um, invited guests and other folks who had some kind of um, expertise in natural shorelines. And the topics covered, um, we'll see that in a, in a moment, but they were tailored to Oakland County and um, particularly the rules and regulation unit was always taught by um, a, sta a staff person from the state regula regulatory agency. The, the the image that you see there on the left is a very important component of these homeowner workshops. If you um, are able to see that graphic on the right side, um, that is a very um, well-known publication from University of Minnesota. And um, we always used to use that for our shoreline programs. But now that um, since the inception of the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership, we were able to um, create our own guidebook that was customized to Michigan. And so that is what these homeowner workshops and the train the trainers were based off of. Um, a few things to note about um, the post workshop surveys. So we gave uh, written um, reflective surveys that we conducted at before and after each homeowner workshop. And what we found out was that um, the level of knowledge, so prior to the workshop, approximately 11% of participants indicated they were knowledgeable about Michigan rules and regulations, for example, one topic that we asked them about. And this percentage increased 57% after the um, workshop. So we were pleased to see this um, increase in perceived knowledge. We also asked them about the importance of natural shorelines and um, from pre to post. So post in, um, depicted in the blue and post in the red, uh, we found that 8% of the participants indicated being very knowledgeable, and that increased to 56% post. Um, interesting to note is the folks that said they were knowledgeable. Um, and we, we, we think that that has to do with um, which 33 and 39% pre and post. We um, thought that that was interesting uh, because some of the folks that were um, attending these programs were um, certified natural shoreline professionals, um, folks that had some level of knowledge going in already. So just to share a few um, last um, bits of information about some of the things we learned from these post surveys. Um, we could, we were told, we had, um, people had shared with us some comments about um, how we, that we heard from participants um, that they saw the need for this type of programming and how they could implement what they learned to help their lake. Uh, so this particular individual was very, um, the pre and the 
I'm sorry, the case studies were, it, were very useful to them. So we found that there were some components of our workshops that were particularly helpful to individuals. Um, so to wrap up, uh, in the future, they, we, we plan to offer um, some follow-up surveys, not only to the participants of the homeowner workshops, but also the shoreline educators um, to identify impacts. Um, practices that they implemented and things along those lines. Um, trying to consider also what kind of web-based opportunities we might be able to offer. Um, also expanding into the northern parts of um, the state, including the Upper Peninsula, and also considering which we're, also, we're planning to do this summer is to reach out to adjacent states to do programming. And then also to um, really better incorporate some opportunities to actually see natural shoreline projects and demonstration areas um, rather than just looking at them through presentations. So I just wanted to thank you again for the opportunity. And I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Great. Thank you, Binda. And now we have two um, Two speakers for you, Pam Toshner and Pat Goggin, are going to go next. And you can see um, Pamela is from uh, the Department of Natural Resources, a lake biologist and healthy team leader. And uh, again, just a reminder for folks, if you have questions, to please submit them in the chat box. And we'll get to them after our presentations are completed, which um, should be in 15 minutes or so. So uh, go ahead, Pam. Patrick is here with me as well. Patrick is a lake specialist with UW Extension. And we're going to tag team on Wisconsin's Healthy Lakes Initiative, which includes best practices for lake-friendly living. Thanks to all of you folks for participating today. Uh, we really appreciate this opportunity. I know Patrick's been heavily involved um, with many of you in the past. We're speaking on behalf of a team of folks that includes people from uh, land and water conservation and zoning departments in um, several counties in Wisconsin, as well as our central office staff at Wisconsin DNR and some other um, field staff. And most importantly, importantly, we relied heavily on lakeshore property owners and local businesses who've been doing this type of work uh, for a long time in the state. So um, the Michigan speakers already reviewed some of the background on the impact of development. Um, there's a lot of studies in Wisconsin and nationally that show with increasing development, we see decreasing habitat and decreasing fish and wildlife populations. On the top left of your screen is just one example for green frogs in the northern part of the state. You can see um, with more homes per mile, we have a decline in green frogs along that lake shore. And when we get to Wisconsin's um, zoning standards for home constructions on lake shore, there's basically no green frogs remaining. The silver lining in some of these studies, though, is it's not necessarily the development itself that's causing these declines. It's the behaviors that people bring with them when they move to lake shores. So things like mowing the lawn down to the water's edge, removing trees that have fallen in the water, removing aquatic plants, and other habitats. So that begs the question, what has happened to the people? Why are people who love lakes so much that they make a life goal to live on or near them um, destroying the very habitat um, that draws them to the water? We're fortunate here that we've had um, several social scientists dig into the lakeshore property owner behaviors in the state and trying to find out what makes people tick, um, why do they um, continue to remove or destroy habitat even though they may know better. And two of the big outcomes of some of the social science is the number one influence for um, Lakeshore property owners is what their neighbors are doing. So they may know that a wild shoreline is better than a mowed shoreline, but if their neighbors are mowing, their chances are they're going to mow. Um, another uh, major thing that we've learned and it's common in social science in general is there's something called the reactance theory. And that is if you tell people that they're doing something wrong, some people 
are more likely to resist your efforts and they may even undermine them. And I think government agencies have really struggled in the past with kind of going to the public and talking about all the things they're doing wrong um, as far as managing their properties and we see the pushback on that. So um, we combine this natural science and the social science with the fact that in Wisconsin we've got over 15,000 lakes. Statewide, 15% of the property that is owned is on lakes or rivers. And when you move into the northern parts of the state, like on the image on the right, um, some counties, the darkest blue counties, for example, almost 70% of the properties in those counties is on lake shores or rivers. So we've been asking ourselves, how can we get more of these folks to care about the lakes, take a stake in the lake, and um, do best practices that will protect or improve their lake shores? Um, the Wisconsin DNR has had grant funding available for sh things like shoreline restoration for over a decade. We've had some successes, but not the level of success um, we would have liked to see. And part of that is simply the bureaucracy and the paperwork in getting those grants. So we were able at Wisconsin DNR to um, get our leadership's approval to um, initiate a lean government project, which is basically a process that came out of the manufacturing industry nearly 20 years ago, to try and streamline processes. And our goal was to protect and improve the health of Wisconsin lakes by increasing lakeshore property owner participation and habitat restoration and runoff and erosion control projects. When we started, that goal was related strictly to the grant funding. We just wanted to make it easier to get our Wisconsin DNR grant funding in the hands of lakeshore property owners. And it has since expanded um, to become more of a do-it-yourselfer program um, and other opportunities through Healthy Lakes. With that, I will turn it over to Patrick, who will explain in more detail about the process itself. Yeah, that, that scale issue was a big roadblock and barrier um, for a lot of folks to adopt some of these best practices. So thankfully, Healthy Lakes was able to scale back or scale down some of the, the sizing of these projects and bring up five best practices to the table that folks can achieve. And you see in the image two of the big goals, one was already talked about by our Michigan colleagues. That, the, that is the idea of a holistic approach to the parcel and trying to get folks to pay attention to their whole parcel and the management of that parcel as it relates to the in-lake zone, the transition zone at that land water interface, and the upland area around the house and, and out onto the property and helping the landowner um, think about that whole picture. Also, the three layers of vegetation you see there, trying to get the uh, you know, a lot of times the canopy is left there, whether it's a Bible camp or an individual homeowner. They might leave the canopy, but that shrub layer and ground layer really suffers. And so we, uh, the Healthy Lakes uh, Initiative uh, has implemented grant funding or a do-it-yourself approach using the information on the website to help folks uh, reach these five best practices. And they can integrate these five best practices, hopefully, into their local planning efforts, whatever those look like. It might be a lake management plan with a lake group. It might be a municipal entity that's working on a planning effort uh, for recreational trails or, or use of uh, lake, uh, lake systems, or just the individual lakefront property owner looking for a do-it-yourself project to help them conserve water, storm water control, and or uh, rehabilitate or restore habitat on their property. So starting down in the water with number one there, the five best practices are fish sticks. The second is native planting. So this is the lakeshore uh, native planting right at that land water interface somewhere within the 35 foot buffer area. The third practice is about access roads and, and trying to deal with the runoff coming down those roads. So it's either a diversion or a water bar type best practice where we're uh, diverting that water safely to a place for infiltration. And it might be the fourth practice that it, it is brought to, that's a rock infiltration, where we have a, an area of rock that's put into the ground and able to take that store water and allow it to infiltrate. And the fifth practice is, is, is the twofer, the rain garden, where you both get both the habitat uh, restoration value for things like pollinators and migratory birds and the water conservation uh, heavy lifting of controlling stormwater. And so 
uh, some tools in the toolbox, so to speak, and on the Healthy Lakes website that helps lake communities engage with this program. First off, kind of to help the Healthy Lakes team uh, look through a long, broad approach, we have a statewide plan that talks through in a few simple pages what this implementation of the Healthy Lakes initiative looks like. How we're trying to respond to those drivers we've learned about through the National Lakes Assessment and other research in Wisconsin as it relates to uh, the health of lakeshore habitat and it needing our help. And in fact, local communities can use this, uh, this statewide plan too to help them guide if they don't have a, a local plan. The other two tools that we have for each of the five best practices are a best practice fact sheet, which describes in a two-page format simply some of the how-tos, what the timeline for doing the best practice looks like, whether you might need a permit, or uh, whether there's cost share money available, this kind of thing. Uh, different tools to help you understand what the best practice is and how you go forward with implementing it. And then there's also a funding and administrative frequently asked questions uh, fact sheet that helps people connect to what are the nuts and bolts of how a lake community gets access to this grant program. And then for each of the five best practices, again, to also help it from a do-it-yourself point of view, we have a technical guide. And you'll see the fish sticks example up on the screen, but there's also a companion document for each of the other best practices that coaches folks up on how to initiate that best practice and work with it. Back to Pamela. So we're fortunate that we have a grant program in the state um, over, I think we have over four and a half million dollars a year available for different lake um, and aquatic invasive species grant type projects. Healthy Lakes is one component of that. The state has reserved $200,000 a year to fund these best practices. Each best practice is capped at $1,000. And that, um, when our team was designing the program, $1,000 actually came out to be about the average cost for each of those best practices, and we're seeing that was a, a good choice, that number. Um, eligible sponsors are defined in our statutes, and they include lake associations, lake districts, counties, towns. So an eligible sponsor would have to apply on behalf of willing landowners. And this is actually, it's, it's started off somewhat as seemingly a possible hurdle, but it's actually become a very good thing because these local community groups then take the lead on managing the individuals, working through contracts. We're seeing um, retired engineers, master gardeners, things like that, get out there and walk through site visits and do the design work. It's pretty amazing. Um, the grants themselves are two-year agreements, and then the individuals sign 10-year contracts um, with maintenance requirements. The maintenance requirements are very transparent. They're on the back of each fact sheet. So when someone is working with a property owner, they can flip it over and say, if you get funding from Wisconsin DNR, these are the expectations for you. I'd also just interject, I saw some tribal partners on the uh, call or signed up for today's webinar, and our 11 tribal nations are also eligible, and we have our first one this, this go around, so that's exciting. Um, you can see on the image here, we have signs. These are optional. Folks want to mark their best practice. Some people actually are choosing to put them on their mailbox posts as people drive by. They're getting more um, attention from their neighbors doing it that way. And we have Dan, a gentleman who caught a walleye, the only apparent fish caught during the governor's fishing opener last year, and he caught it out of a fish six that was funded with Healthy Lakes funding. Um, as far as statewide results, the program's been in place for three years now. Our team had a goal to double participation in three years, but we more than doubled it in two years, and we've seen um, increased demand each year. We funded 407 best practices, 200, at 267 properties, 56 lakes. The pins on the map are the lakes in 21 counties. Um, some kind of special surprises, we immediately had interest from the southeast part of the state, which is the most developed, and we didn't expect that, so that was good. We've had repeat customers both in a um, lake group applicant sense, as well as individual lakeshore property owners who want to do more. 
And the results are, um, these are the more subjective results, so we've had the opportunity to go out and visit some of these sites in person, and it's just um, amazing to see how excited these folks are to share the work they've been doing. And their own personal stories are really quite engaging and interesting. As one example, Bill Becky's in the um, center there in that white frame. He lives on Beaver Dam Lake in Dodge County, which is a large shallow impoundment. And they have major agricultural runoff problems in their watershed. Bill led the effort on behalf of his lake group and on his own property because he knew in order to have a positive relationship with the farmers and work on runoff issues, um, Lakeshore property owners need to um, take action on their own properties as well. And one of the other neat wrinkles to the Healthy Lakes program to date is these champions, whether it's a, a contractor who's helping put these projects in or these landowners like Bill and others in this, these pictures, they're helping us teach other lake communities what Healthy Lakes has to offer. So for example, I'm headed Friday to Oconomowoc to join Bill and a City of Delafield representative to share the story of Healthy Lakes. So it's pretty special that they're helping us um, uh, market and, and other lake communities get their head around Healthy Lakes. And so we steer you to the HealthyLakesWI.com website. It's a tool that has all, it's a standalone website that we used our UW Extension ERC Environmental Resources Center to help create such that uh, we hope people can easily find these materials instead of burying it on an extension or DNR website. One of the other wrinkles is we also have a Lakeshore Habitat Restoration Training uh, similar to the Michigan experience. We've learned a lot from Michigan for Healthy Lakes and that training and that's an integral part of moving Healthy Lakes along as well. And uh, every year at our Wisconsin Lakes Partnership Convention we do a Healthy Lake session so you can always look to uh, that opportunity to learn more about Healthy Lakes or go to the website and watch a webinar or other uh, information there. And I think that's all we have. Uh, sounds like it's time for question and answer time. Thank you. Thanks to you both. Um, great presentations and thanks to all of you for great presentations. So let's go right on to questions here. Um, John uh, Ransom from Michigan asked the first question about uh, any funding out there to help folks implement shoreline projects and uh, Wisconsin folks did a great job at covering funding here in Wisconsin. Can we um, hear some more from the Michigan folks about potential funding support out there for Michigan? Sure. So Michigan does not have a funding program like Wisconsin. It's fairly limited towards inland lakes at this point. There are some grants that have been directed to inland lakes, but it's fairly limited. And, and those funding sources come through the DEQ's non-point source program that I'm a part of. But there's a lot of hoops you got to jump through, and it has to be prioritized, and et cetera. But I am working on, I have worked on a couple grants that um, do have projects in place to do shoreline inventorying as well as do some implementation of some projects in, in those particular lakes. It's not widespread. Uh, our Michigan DNR and I have been talking about, well, how can, what are some options that we could potentially, that they could potentially direct some uh, money to, and with their DNR aquatic habitat grants towards more in the lake projects. And then in the future, there may be an opportunity to direct some more of this non-point source grant funds to in the lakes. We just have to set up a process to do that. So other than that, um, there are some local funding sources that uh, different lake associations that have tapped, uh, just local foundations, uh, to do some cost sharing opportunities as well. So there really isn't any like statewide funding. But we're working on that and we're, we're looking at some discussions to maybe at least target from, even, a, even if it's just a select um, handful of lakes, to, to get some more uh, funding towards that. This is Pat again. And one other uh, source I would direct folks to, and I think they'll have more funding available into the future, is the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership, which is kind of getting rejuvenated and has assisted communities in the Midwest with projects before. So I'll keep this group informed about that opportunity moving ahead. Thank you, Pat. Appreciate that. Um, 
Okay, Lois has a question. Where, uh, where fish stick programs have been implemented, has there been any associated studies on improved fisheries? Hi, this is Pamela Tashner, Wisconsin DNR. We, there's been studies since the 1990s. I think the Christensen paper, if you go to the DNR website, um, there's a fish sticks link and there's a list of reference studies that most of them so far have focused on the removal of wood and the impacts of the removal of wood. Um, but right now in Wisconsin, there is a very long term, it was probably going to be a 20 year plus study going on about what happens when you add wood and what are the fisheries impacts. We know from the removal studies that basically all fish species depend on that woody habitat at some um, stage in their lives, but we can't really say with certainty what happens when you add the wood. Um, so we hope to learn more to that. Greg Sass is a um, DNR researcher who's leading that effort here in the state. Okay, great. Thank you, Pamela. And uh, Debbie's asking, any idea if there are similar programs in uh, Indiana? And uh, maybe she's talking about both Michigan and um, Wisconsin programs. So maybe um, uh, any of you can speak to if you, you know about similar Indiana programs. So this is Julia. I, as far as I know, there is not any like concentrated programming in Indiana related to this. I know that we've had some Indiana folks come to Michigan and go through some of our trainings with the intention of gathering knowledge and gathering information on how to take it back and do something there. But I've not really seen anything in Indiana, even in some of their workshops or conferences, there isn't anything even related to natural shoreline information. Thank you. And uh, I might suggest uh, con contacting Jane Frankenberger for more information as well, um, just to uh, see if she might be aware of anything. And she, Jane Frankenberger is at Purdue University. Okay, Eugene Brigg has our next question. Do any of the panelists offer much programming for residents along artificial impoundments? If so, can you discuss how much, uh, how such programming differs from that for natural lakes? Well, um, I'm not sure. Well, so I'm going to answer it from the way I think it's going to, it's being implied. So when you're looking, because we do have some impoundments in, in Michigan, and the approach is somewhat, when you're looking at doing shoreline restoration or shoreline erosion control, that approach depends on the site and those site conditions are taken into account. Um, so it's not necessarily an either or, it's like, well, what, what's your site and how do you approach it? Everything on the land applies completely and is the same based if it's a natural lake or an impounded lake. But in terms of how you do shoreline erosion control and what the solutions are, are going to be a little different comparatively because the impoundments act different than natural uh, unimpounded lakes. But it was the same kind of technology or thought process. Yeah, and I just wanted to add uh, to what Julia um, just mentioned that uh, we do get folks who, you know, express interest in coming to our natural shoreline uh, workshops for property owners, and they do indicate sometimes that they um, are talking about an artificial impoundment or something like that, and um, we we generally just explain that a lot of the concepts that we're teaching would apply to. Um, that type of situation. We also get um, questions kind of as a related uh, topic. Does, do, does your program um, consider um, Great Lakes shoreline? So that, of course, is a little bit of a different story. So um, we don't have a great uh, program to address that kind of an issue. Um, but we found that folks who do live, live on artificial impoundments or things like that uh, do get the benefit of um, learning the, the sort of uh, techniques and the importance of natural shorelines from our programs. 
And, and this is Rebecca. John Ransom has a, a related question too about stream and river riparian. So are, are these programs applicable to stream and river shorelines as well? So and just the, the, um, there are some people that, ha ha that live on rivers that have gone through the shoreland steward survey. And for the most part, it applies. The land stuff applies. Where it gets different is, is where you start doing erosion control. Some of the concepts and some of the materials are going to be used in both river restoration or, and shoreline erosion control as it would be in a lake. But the difference is, is that the energy in a river and how a river moves is very different in how a lake moves. So the concepts, and, and there's a lot more information that needs to be gathered and utilized from a river, river system. So we, from our erosion control concepts and trainings, we very much focus on only in the lakes. And there's other trainings that are specific for rivers. But Pamela, um, Patrick here, um, as far as artificial impoundment, we don't distinguish between those and you know, natural lakes for healthy lakes. Um, people who live on impoundments and flowages are certainly eligible to apply, and they have. And for streams and rivers, we will be expanding probably in the next year to two to include stream and river properties. Um, the challenge with that would be the fish sticks because they have a different permitting process. And um, like the other panelists just mentioned, the high energy locations would be more challenging for rivers. So we haven't figured out how to deal with fish sticks specifically, but the other best practices will be stream and river eligible in the future. Yeah, and people have asked if our shoreland stewards will be expanded to include rivers. And at this point, you know, it's such a new program. We're, we're still focused on getting this up and running and adding the other components we want to add. And, um, and we'd need more money and, and time in order to make it river specific because there are some things that would need to change. Great, thank you. Well, it sounds um, sounds like uh, we look forward to more information on uh, rivers and streams and shoreline restoration and um, uh, shoreline stewardship for those kinds of landscapes. I did want to point out uh, that uh, Joe Noner, uh, who manages the uh, let me make sure uh, the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership, has put a link down there uh, for uh, down in the chat box for people if they're interested in taking a look um, at that information. Uh, any other questions from our participants? Well, I had one final question before we wrap up, and it, uh, it's related to nutrient management. So um, how much of a focus do, uh, does each program put on uh, looking at nutrient management or you know, reduction of, of nutrients entering into lakes uh, from uh, better shoreline stewardship? Um. So from the Michigan perspective, you know, our program, the program that I work with is a non-point source program, and we are for the most part focused on that nutrient runoff reduction. So but when we talk, but that's not exactly a uh, pretty topic to talk about. <laughs> it's embedded in the entire program, the Shoreland Stewards program, and we do still, you know, focus on how do you reduce that runoff from a nutrient standpoint as well and create infiltration. So when you work through the shoreland stewards thing, there are questions about fertilizer reduction not, and not fertilizing in the, in the buffer zone at all, uh, reduce, you know, using rain gardens to um, capture that rain garden. So, so there is some focus on that as well. In Wisconsin Lake communities, uh, nutrient challenges are often uh, just that, a challenge. And we coach from a Wisconsin Lakes Partnership point of view to take that holistic approach. And it's a watershed-wide effort to get after those nutrients, whether it's uh, a mix of agriculture and 
uh, the land water interface of shoreline property owners or other drivers in the watershed that are bringing that nutrient to, to the water. And so, it, you know, uh, Pamela mentioned Bill and on Beaver Dam Lake there in the, our egg dominated watershed in, in southern Wisconsin. And really for that lake community to begin to work with farmers, uh, they really felt that their shoreline property owners had to be walking the walk too, as, as Pamela mentioned. And so everyone has to come together and often in our lake management plans, a nutrient budget is figured out for that lake and it begins to uh, reveal where that nutrient is coming from, what the drivers are and how can we begin to work with the different users uh, or the drivers of that nutrient to uh, move it towards a different trend. Yeah, I would agree that's with Patrick completely too is when we're looking at that if nutrients are an issue in a lake, that's the, the approach we'll take as well. But for a lot of lakes, our nutrients aren't an issue. But when you start looking at a holistic nutrient issue, we look at the entire watershed from that lake planning standpoint. Well, that's a great place to end it. Uh, the, the, the we're all in this together message, and there's something that we all can do uh, to have healthier lakes. So. Thank you all so much for great presentations and thanks to our participants for joining us in the conversation today. You can see uh, contact information for today's speakers here um, uh, on your screen and we hope uh, that you will, will contact them with any additional questions um, that you have. They're, they're great resources and we hope you will join us for a future uh, webinar. Uh, our upcoming, our next session is July 19th, 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern, and it's a surprise topic at this point. We're still working on um, getting speakers uh, for it, but stay tuned for more information, uh, either through our e-newsletter or on our the North Central uh, Water.org website, and um, thanks so much, and hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. <laughs>